offer is what is an intentionally designed relationship? And then what are the kinds of relationships that we have in our day-to-day -day lives that we might want to be more intentional about designing, uh, specifically at work? So our relationships with the company we work for and their relationships with us. Um, you know, so um, if you're a manager, uh, how you might intentionally design relationships with your teams to get more out of them, more value. Uh, relationships between teams and inside teams. Relationships with ourselves, work, and time. So where did my, where did this topic come from? So I'm interested in brains and neuroscience and psychology. These are some of my hobby interests. And so I'm also interested in organizational design and organizational behavior and leadership. And you know, I'm an agile practitioner, so I'm interested in the influence that agile ideas plays uh, or has on how teams design themselves and, and operate. So I read a lot of articles about these topics. And one article was about uh, Ed, uh, was from Edmund Lau, who was an engineering uh, manager out in so Silicon Valley and now has a firm called Co-Leadership. And so he teaches managers how to manage better. And he wrote this article. Uh, I found it in the fall, so I think it had just come out. And it's about effective one-on-ones. And he brings up this concept of designing your relationships with intention. And so one of the quotes from this article I've shared here is, uh, the most important thing to do in any collaborative relationship is to explicitly design the relationship. So you would do this for a number of reasons, including building alliances so that you can actually have complex relationships that are sustainable and work in helping you get things done. So like in an inner source environment, the more teams you have aligned behind practicing inner source, the more successful any sort of inner source initiative might be. Uh, you would also design your relationships as a form of controlling the relationship, maintaining control of yourself and your emotions as well as being assertive and keeping your side of the street like, so that you actually uh, don't lose ground in any relationship that you're in. And so in an inner source practicing environment, you might uh, benefit from this because then your boundaries and your team and the work that you're doing in your team, you can, you can negotiate collaboration more effectively without uh, incre incurring any harm. So again, going back to Lau's article, like, you might be starting to see why designing your relationship can preserve your ability to collaborate effectively. Not too long after I read this article by Edmund, I was reconnected with a friend from college, so you know, many, many, many years ago. And my friend, who is actually uh, American but now living near Munich, is training to be a coach for people, especially women, who would like to enhance their careers and their work lives and their personal lives as well. And so she uh, was uh, a friend of ours, connected me to her, and. Uh, Katie, who you see here, is taking clients, like uh, practicing uh, her her coaching, uh, so for a reduced price. And so, you know, I thought, well, why not why not help her out and also see help myself out. And so, uh, we have a six sessions, a six session agenda together. And even though we are friends and have this shared context going way back, for the relationship of coaching to be successful, we have to put some boundaries around that relationship so that she can be an effective coach and I can be, an, be a responsive client. And so on our very first session, uh, we worked on these boundaries and she was asking me what my goals and my expectations were and also providing her goals and expectations for, for the relationship or this this aspect of it, and this was all fundamentally in, uh, intentional relationship design. So that's what we were doing. You know, we were taking uh, a relationship in which we had a certain dynamic, but for getting something done, for collaborating in a coaching relationship, we define these parameters to work successfully. 
So uh, this is a good time to define what exactly is this intentional relationship design stuff. It comes from the therapeutic world. And so coaching is often uh, very similar to the re a relationship between a therapist and a client. Um, because there's an element of uh, transformation and change and helping involved. So in the therapeutic world, uh, this manner of relating between therapists and clients um, requires a lot of intention and a lot of clarity about the boundaries. And so there is in Illinois, in one of the universities here, University of Illinois in Chicago, a whole nonprofit dedicated towards this topic of intentional relationship design. And it's how they, this is how they define it. It's how the client and the therapist contribute to the unique and interpersonal dynamic that becomes that therapeutic relationship. You know, in these relationships, you're talking about very private matters, emotions, um, behaviors, actions. And so for the client to feel protected, they need to be able to trust that their therapist will respect their boundaries. In turn, for a therapist to maintain their role successfully as the helper, the person who helps the client solve the problems, they also need to establish you know, very clearly their own boundaries for working in that relationship safely and successfully. Um, the International, uh, the Intentional Relationship Design Clearinghouse has provided on their website this list of 10 principles to further explain what uh, intentional relationship design means and how it's done. And so a lot of these principles, or all of them actually, can be applied uh, in an agile environment and also uh, inner source is one, one way we can help teams become more agile. So if we look at these principles, for example, self-awareness, uh, if we take in, in the software development context, when teams are self-aware, they can actually understand how they are relating to other teams, they can understand their goals better, how they're achieving their goals, specific patterns and behaviors that may be helping or hindering their ability to achieve their goals. And in an inner source context, this means uh, that a team who is, has heightened self-awareness can navigate the relationships with other teams a lot more effectively by, by knowing exactly what their needs are and how they like to communicate and then also um, establishing a, a healthy boundary with another team in working together and communicating effectively. Um, being self-disciplined uh, is very important for uh, software teams so that they stay focused, um, so that they achieve goals for the company. And so in an inner source context, this is very important because um, if you're collaborating with other teams, you wanna make sure that the vision of a service or a component remains you know, the same or that it continues to offer value to, to the organization. So you don't want to um, at least unintentionally change the, the whole purpose of something. You know, you want, if you do change uh, something dramatically, you want to be aware of the impacts of that change. And so you know, teams working together, being, being disciplined about staying uh, true to, to the purpose of their work can, can mean that collaborations will not result in negative impacts. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole list of these, uh, but uh, again, like um, cultural competency. So this could apply in an inner source organization by enabling teams to work effectively across, you know, different um, work styles, uh, having empathy for each other, you know, enabling uh, a junior from Team A to work successfully with a principal engineer from Team B on solving the same, you know, inner source related problem. You know, being able to include all, any and all members of an organization uh, to drive software development. And it also means not seeing other teams as rivals, but as collaborators and contemporaries. When we put together some of these practices or principles from the last slide, self-awareness, um, inclusion, resilience, uh, we are more and more capable to actually control the dynamics of our relationships because with self-awareness, you know, we can actually 
think about whether the contracts that we're making, um, so in an inner source context, that would be uh, a collaboration with a different team. So we can actually stop and reflect on how we would like that um, relationship to play out, how we would like to control our end of the bargain and be helpful, and you know what we would accept and not accept. And so um, with that in mind, this quote from Viktor Frankl is really quite, uh, gets at the heart of how, um, like the very, the very manner in which we can control and design our relationships. Um, and I took this quote actually from a, from a book by a, psycholo a psychologist at Harvard Medical School who has written about emotional agility. So her name is uh, Susan David, and so she's taken this concept of agility and applied it to everyday life. And you know, so how do we remain agile in our familial relationships or our friendships? Um, how do we adapt to changes in those relationships over time to preserve those relationships and to also preserve ourselves and our own self-image in those relationships? Um, so her, one of the quotes that she refers to repeatedly in the book is this one, you know, between a stimulus and response, there is a space, and in that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. And so the space is often you know, hitting the pause button before we take an action or say something, reflecting and catching ourselves to make sure that uh, we can go on the record safely and um, or, you know, take the consequences of, of that and that the consequences can be productive and preserving of, of our collaborations. In our, in our relationships. So why would, we, why would we want to be mindful of this ability to hit that pause button and reflect? Well, in the software development context, uh, it's extremely helpful to, to take that pause and before, before making, making a decision or taking an action. A lot of times when we're not intentional, uh, we find ourselves in conflicts that maybe not even based on fact, but just on assumptions. Uh, we have drama, we have waste. Waste of time, waste of people's energy, uh, waste of money. Uh, confusion, so confusion about what we're building, why we're building it, why we're building it now. Um, this means that uh, we have misalignments and delays in getting software out the door. And in an agile context, it can actually breed cynicism because if uh, teams come to understand Agile as being confusing or uh, not effective, um, they may start to actually see Agile as the problem and not a solution. Uh, so similarly, inner source, if you're, if you're not mindfully engaging with other teams, if you're not truly listening to other teams and what they desire or what they want to do uh, with your with your software, you know, how do they want to help enhance it? How do they want to contribute to it? Uh, you may take a perfectly great opportunity to form a collaboration uh, that is more successful, more profitable, more fun for the teams uh, and, and ruin it. So, and then that's a waste of an opportunity. So when we're intentional, we can protect our collaborations. We can build trust reduce cognitive load, that, so instead of thinking about the conflicts and the dramas and navigating the politics, we can just focus on the work. Um, we can also drive experimentation and safe risk taking because instead of being caught up in these misunderstandings and misalignments, uh, we actually have now created a record of being able to collaborate successfully and this builds confidence for teams that then they can take uh, they can take on further collaborations or expand collaborations, um, pursue even riskier uh, opportunities, but, but do so successfully together. And of course, this would drive focus because, again, you're not focusing on drama, you're focusing on, on the goal, which is to de deliver software. So why do we become unintentional? Um, so we're not perfect, like hamsters. You know, we don't, uh, we are human beings, and so we uh, are get caught up in ourselves. We get caught up in the dramas of our life or uh, our own goals that may or may not involve or enhance the lives of others. 
uh, we're often not present. So you know, our lives are very complex now. We have millions of pieces of information that we're intercepting every day. Uh, one researcher has noted it's around 11 million pieces of information that we take in on any given day, from sensory impressions to data to whatever's on the internet to uh, you know, very imperceptible signals it's, that are uh, hitting us at a subconscious level. And our brains can't catch up with 11 million pieces of information, obviously, so it does what it can to, to process that information as effectively as it can. So categorizing information, trying to understand and detect patterns. Uh, these may or may not, these patterns may or may not be real, but our brain is trying its best to make sense of, of our world. Uh, if our world and this, those uh, interpretations theme, seem threatening, then we may have a strong emotional response to them in the manner of fear or anger or anxiety. And this will become a distraction from what is actually happening in real time, factually, around us. When we're caught up in this emotional cycle, we'll forget alternatives to being re reactive. Uh, and so being intentional in our relationships may no longer seem like an option, or we may just overlook it. Uh, you know, again, our brain is trying its best to process what's, what it's in taking in. And so this can lead us to have biases around, uh, in, you know, one form is a recency bias. So this thing I see now is very much like the last thing that I saw that is sort of similar. Um, you know, so in, a, in our inner source context, that might mean that, okay, this team most recently, my, my last experience interacting with this team was not so great. So I should just come to expect that any re interaction I have with this team will not be so effective and, and fruitful. Um, but it may have just been a bad day for that team, and so, but your brain might not, uh, you might not think of that option. You might just categorize a team or a type of relationships with them as negative and, and never consider it again. Um, confirmation bias is an, you know, another form of our information uh, intake uh, tripping us up, um, only looking for evidence that confirms our assumptions and overlooking or minimizing the importance of other evidence that would prove it to be contrary. Um, listening and not listening is uh, not listening is obviously a, a way that we can become unintentional in our relationships because we're just not even taking in the information that someone is trying to send our way. And listening is very hard. It's a skill that many of us uh, have intermittently or we may not have it at all. <laughs> like I know some people who I would say really struggle with this one. Um, but if you're not able to listen to someone or, or, or your surroundings, you may make the wrong conclusion. And our egos can often get in the way. Um, luckily, hamsters don't have strong egos, so they don't face this problem. They can just relax and, and be fine. But you know, with human beings, we're, we're always acting in self-interest in some way or another. And so when that uh, impulse becomes uh, too strong, it can become a distraction and also skew our relationships. When we're not being intentional, when we're not being fully present, you know, we will, we will do these things. We will make assumptions that are false. Uh, we will jump to conclusions or make hasty decisions based on our perspective on the information that we have, whether it's correct or incorrect. We may project emotions or motivations onto people or teams without those being true. Um, we may not ask for what we need. So, in an inner source context, this might mean that you know, we really want a team to do something uh, for, with us, but because we project that they can't, or that they won't listen to us, or they won't be interested in, in hearing our case and, and deciding together with us, uh, we may just say, well, that's not possible, and never pursue it. Um, you know, so this is also very, uh, this comes up a lot in those one-on-one -on -one relationships that Edmund Lau, the guy who wrote the article that is why we're here, uh, you know, he, he calls out that we often don't ask our managers for what we need to become more successful in our careers. Um, so we don't ask for those opportunities to prove ourselves 
in the realm of taking on a complex project and, and driving it home. We don't ask for training that we would like to have to enhance our skill set. So again, this can trickle down in an inner source context because if we're on a team and we think that this inner source stuff sounds like a great idea, but we're not feeling comfortable or we don't know if we can raise this with our, our, our lead or another team, you know, our, our best friend and the neighboring team, we, we, you know, we may just never pursue that opportunity and uh, then we lose out. Um, so we might develop a frustration around losing this opportunity. We might start to feel trapped in this reality that we've created that uh, inner source is not possible. You know, we'll always have to wait for uh, changes to be made or we'll um, never be able to absorb changes to our software that other teams would like to make. You know, we're just stuck. And that may not be true, but when we're telling ourselves that it is true, then, then it's true until we stop thinking like that. Um, we'll continue to lose opportunities then because we'll have this feeling of being stuck. And you know, we'll start to dwell mostly in the realm of the feelings that we have of frustration, of can't do, instead of like the realm of possibility, which, which may be different. Um, we also might rely on mind reading powers that we never have. Uh, well, I guess some people might have them, but you know, most of us, are not, uh, we would not be able to make careers as mind readers. Um, but we, we expect other people to read our minds, and this is a very bad idea because they can't. And if you're in a fast-paced software development environment, they absolutely can't because they're busy dealing with 50 other things at any given time. Um, so, you know, in an inner source context, this means like, if you want a team to make a change uh, on your software or you know for so that you can continue working like you can't do it for them right now like and if you don't communicate that they have this option to um, make a pull request themselves um, and here's how to do that safely here's how we would like you to do that so it's not disrupting our work it's not the wrong pull request you know you don't waste your time spending two weeks making this thing and then you know try to ask us to merge it and we, we decide it's not wrong, like, be, be clear, tell people what you want, tell them your expectations, set those boundaries around how you would like to collaborate. Um, and then mind reading and its many, many risks are no longer an issue for you. Again, this is about uh, boundaries. So a great analogy is just the human cell. It's a thing that can take in oxygen, Nutri nutrition, nutrients, um, bad things like uh, viruses, but um, ideally in a healthy functioning cell, it's got a membrane, so it has a distinct boundary and allows these things to come in and also it puts things out. Um, so a boundary is not like a wall which is impenetrable. It's often, you know, a healthy boundary is not so soft that any and everything can come in and out. Um, in a, in a software development context, the boundary of, of a team would be like you don't say no to all the things. You don't say no to opportunities to uh, do inner source with other teams. Uh, you don't, or collaborate in other ways. Um, you consider those opportunities before making a decision. You're open. Um, the same way is you're not taking every and any opportunity to collaborate or do something with other teams or for other teams, because if you did that, you would never be able to focus on your goals. Um, and then you would lose sight of the boundaries that preserve you from being sucked into things that are not rel related to your fundamental purpose. Um, we often have, if we, uh, you know, poor boundaries are a common issue. Um, maintaining boundaries is something we have to be mindful of. It's, uh, you know, intangible, so it, it takes this self-awareness uh, to be able to, to do that. Um, we don't manage our boundaries successfully for a lot of the same reasons that we don't uh, design our relationships uh, intentionally. Fear, anxiety, anger, insecurity, you know, not being sure about what our boundaries are, not considering what our boundaries might be. And also immaturity, just not having experience uh, or awareness to, to enforce our boundaries successfully. 
you know, maybe for a, for a forming team, for example, a forming software team, that team isn't sure of its identity yet. It's just in the start of being a team, and so they're, they don't have a lot of uh, evidence yet to prove where their boundaries might exist, um, what their purpose might truly be. Um, and so, you know, it's a, a growing phase that they have to go through to then have those boundaries they can enforce. Um, once again, to return to the Viktor Frankl quote, you know, between the stimulus and response, there is a space. Again, to reinforce that idea that in that space, in that pausing moment, this is where we maintain the control we have over our relationships and what we do when we collaborate with other teams. Uh, how we design those collaborations to be most successful and effective for all the parties and teams involved and for the business. Um, do we want to intersource with our neighbors? Okay, what are the advantages of doing that? Um, you know, faster delivery, uh, more uh, effective uh, delivery of software, um, new knowledge exchange, uh, those would be advantages. Okay, what might the disadvantages be? Well, we don't know um, if we're ready to, to handle code review that from all these pull requests we'll be intercepting. Um, that's, that's actually a common concern that teams have. Like, we won't be able to review this code. Um, you know, we won't have a pause button. We won't have, we won't be able to pause and, and review this stuff because we're already so busy and, um, you know, now we're going to have more work from other teams and we just can't take this on. Um, but also not, you know, then not reflecting on whether maybe it's actually faster and more effective to review some code than to build something from scratch ourselves. So, you know, pausing, reflecting, asking these questions, looking at all of the different angles and possibilities to the best of our ability can mean the difference between um, taking an opportunity or, or forfeiting one. Um, you know, and a lot of times we may be not sure of what the future brings in a collaborative relationship. We don't have any guarantee it will succeed or, and we might have a risk of failure, um, but it's better to be explicit in calling those possibilities out than to overlook them or to allow them to just lead us to write off that opportunity completely and not, and not try. Um, so if you don't know something, if you don't know the answer to a question, you don't know what the future holds, you know, your level of uh, uncertainty is maybe greater than 50%, fine, just say so. Maybe putting that information out there um, with your potential collaborators will lead to a conversation where you can gain more certainty. Uh, for example, and whether inner source is possible at this time or whether you want to do it in the future. When would that future time be? You know. You don't know, and, and you invite, uh, you put that out and invite some discussion around it. Um, asking people to wait is another way that you can you hit that pause button and reflect before um, taking on a risk that you're not ready to take on. You know, we can't we can't merge your pull request now, but we're going to look at it next week. Um, so you know, we'll come back to you in a week and tell you how how it goes. Thank you for you know c c contributing to our work. Um, now I'm going to just focus on different types of relationships that we have in our, in our daily work lives uh, and, and show you some tips and tricks on how you can actually apply intention to these relationships to make them more intentional and hopefully more successful. So looking at uh, just company relationships, manager relationships, whether you are a manager or you are managed by someone, uh, teams, ourselves, times and budgets, and then our work itself. So at scale, a company is a big collection of relationships, uh, all based around collaborating to drive profits, make software, etc. Um, so companies try to be intentional in their relationships with the world, with their customers, with their teams, the people they hire. Um, and through a number of mechanisms, value statements. So we believe in integrity, and so we expect everyone that works in our organization to do the same. And 
support, you know, integrity in our relationships that we put, you know, that we develop with the outside world as well. Um, product roadmaps are another popular mechanism to design relationships by giving a framework for teams to deliver things, um, you know, a cadence for delivery, uh, thinking about the dependencies and the work being done by related teams and how would, our, how would the roadmap be affected by those uh, dependencies and how would we manage them. Um, a lot of teams use objectives and key results or key performance indicators, so they scale up these relationships um, and expectations for, from teams, from departments, from business units, and try to align them you know, to bring focus for the whole uh, hierarchy of, of levels and for the organization. Um, it's you know, common ways to maintain focus so teams don't go off and deliver like the wrong thing. For these mechanisms to be real, they require some intention, some self-awareness, uh, some self-discipline from an organization. All of those things that were noted in the uh, list of principles that I showed you around designing relationships intentionally and those therapeutic relationships, those principles apply you know, very much in, in the case of a company because without self-discipline, without self-awareness, uh, things can go very quickly into chaos. And often they do go into chaos because maintaining these relationships and these boundaries around you know, all of these different levels of relationships over time is very hard because again, we're human beings. We have emotions, we have drives, we have egos. And in these organizations, all of these human factors pile up and create complexity if there's uh, not intentional, intentionally applied mechanisms to keep them somewhat in, in control. Um, so, you know, we have in many cases that a team might plan a roadmap and a product, but if the company is coming in midway through a quarter and saying, oh, well, actually, we want you to develop this other thing, uh, you know, that will completely derail the team. And it will feel random, it often does if it's poorly communicated. And then that kind of impact of this team being re re derailed will just trickle down and into uh, many different, uh, it will go in many different directions. It can frustrate the team. The, f the team may not feel like they can challenge uh, this new meteor that's like bonged into their landscape. Um, so it's a very, you know, it's very uh, important that companies not do that, but they do. Um, another way that uh, teams uh, or companies may um, fall into unintentionality is by just trying to overcorrect and overcontrol. So, you know, throwing an agile method at the organization and saying, like, okay, well, now we're Scrum. This will solve your problems. We're going to train everybody to do Scrum or Safe or whatever other framework of the day that people, you know, they think will solve all the magic problems and we'll be fine. And then, you know, it often turns out that's not true. And, you know, again, you have that frustration, chaos, because, you know, we thought that having scrum ceremonies would uh, make us deliver faster, but, you know, we just put our faith into that and we didn't actually change our behavior. So um, what happened? When, you know, especially when Agile starts to fail in an organization, the organization might decide that Agile is a big fail in itself and then revert back to old norms, you know, command and control. Um, organizations that get caught up in these um, dynamics often then sk skimp on people development. So, you know, becoming, like, especially in the realm of uh, skills that are not deemed to be profitable, and these skills are often really the most profitable, but because they're not so evident, you know, they get cut. But things like communicating, negotiation, delegation, uh, inner source collaboration, you know, okay, we, we decide that we, we just really need to focus on making software at all costs. You know, we don't care how it's done. We just need to focus on that. And then, you know, 
people's opportunities to be reminded of their relationships at work you know, go down because it's, it's been messaged that that's not a priority. Um, and then if you see companies hire for numbers and not thinking about these skills like communication or uh, negotiation or diplomacy, you know, handling complex organizational relationships, if companies are just hiring thousands of engineers, you know, we don't really know what they'll do, but like, this is how we want to build our company. Like, you'll see that intention falls by the wayside because you didn't think about the values that these people bring to your company, whether those values align with yours, whether their expectations align with yours, whether they can actually collaborate in your organization. If maybe they just, you know, cannot, but now you have to deal with them because you hired them. And so, you know, wouldn't there be a better way? Like maybe you hire people because their values do align with yours and they are effective communicators and they want to drive uh, collaboration beyond, you know, inside their team and beyond and they make it happen. So when you take all of, all of the shortcuts, you know, hiring for numbers, agile by the book, et cetera, you know, you find often that you, you lose focus and again, you produce cynicism about agile or maybe healthy culture or things like inner source, you know, people come to believe that these things just don't work and then making them work becomes ever harder. Again, I, I mentioned doing the agile by the book, so it's, it's kind of like if we just put all of our faith in, in a framework or a method without really thinking about how we apply it, it's like being zombies. If we're not engaged, paying attention to how our application of a given framework or tool like Intersaurus is, you know, how we're using it, how we're learning from it, um, you know, are we using this as a vehicle to listen to each other, communicate and understand each other? Um, are we mindful? Are we acting in that space between the stimulus and the response that Viktor Frankl talked about, where we, you know, are encouraging each other to pause, reflect, and apply these tools mindfully, um, then we're just not being intentional, and we're kind of on the autopilot, and we can expect um, some negative results to fall from that. In a relationship, uh, or in a company relationship where you know, intentionality is, is a key ingredient, you can see that teams can plan. Their, their plans will be respected by the company, you know, the company honors the team's boundaries and the team on its, on its side has to also plan around what the company expects and needs from them. But in, in an intentional rela company relationship, that's what's happening. Uh, you all, in an intentional relationship, you have the agile values that are very hard to define, you know, things like integrity or honesty. These are very hard, you know, they don't exist in concrete space, but People talk about them and they try their best to apply them and then those values inform the way that agile frameworks are applied. Um, in an intentional company, relationships, are ma they matter and it's uh, talked about uh, that relationships are important to the company. You see that being evidenced in developing people to improve their relationship skills uh, in the workplace. And in hiring, you see that people get hired based on a number of skills, not just they can code, but they can manage an inner source uh, project. You know, or, you know, they can push things like inner source to bring teams together to drive bigger and better projects with uh, you know, savings to the company, with more knowledge exchange, um, with faster delivery. Um, I'll run through the remainder because we're running out of time. And, um, but just I want to focus on the relationships, uh, the power of managers, because a manager, uh, becoming a manager is not just a promotion. You're responsible for uh, the careers and the livelihoods of the people that work for you. Um, you're also a key architect of vision and culture, and that's a pretty difficult job if you take it seriously. Um, but being intentional is key to whether you're effective at it or not. So unintentional managers will uh, have a very difficult time uh, bringing inner source into an organization because they won't be able to successfully negotiate the different boundaries between their team and others or their department and other departments. You know, they'll, 
They'll send contradictory messages uh, that are um, unpredictable. And so when you're working in more complex scenarios, uh, this means you're just confusing way more people and um, creating chaos. Um, being silent and stonewalling will, will not help for obvious reasons. You know, what, what does this person, you know, where are they leading us? And if there's no answer, people just won't know. Um, unintentional managers often will vacillate between micromanaging or completely neglecting um, their teams. So, you know, oh, either it's like, being so fine-grained on every single point and, and trying to like orchestrate relationships, uh, you know, interfering constantly or just uh, neglecting uh, a process or relationship so that, uh, you know, leaving people to their own devices. Neither of those things will work um, so well. Um, unintentional managers will not plan, set context or structure uh, pathways to success for their teams. So in an inner source context, you know, if you just say, well, just collaborate and start merging your pull requests together and it'll be fine. Like, but if they don't, if the teams don't know why or what for or see the opportunities of doing that, then again, your chaos will result. Um, you know, unintentional managers will not trust. They often have listening issues and oftentimes they don't want to manage, you know, they should be in a different job. So, but they just stay there because of whatever reason. Um, great managers don't do that. They offer context. They assert boundaries and they help their teams assert boundaries. So, you know, they can actually take on complicated relationships, multiple teams working on something and plan a structure for those teams to be successful by laying the groundwork and the context for those teams to relate to each other. So if there's a communication issue between two teams, they can say, hey teams, we need to talk about this. Let's uh, hear what you have to say. Like, I'm gonna provide some suggestions for you to work better, Let's, but we have to work better. Um, and they do that by, you know, they are able to achieve this by listening, noticing, observing, and asking questions. They, they bring intention to the table and, you know, then they can actually spot the opportunities and pathways out of chaos for, for their teams. Um, I'm gonna give you just a couple quick examples of uh, one tool that uh, people have become, have started to use uh, in different companies, different managers are starting to create these readmes so that they can actually set their expectations very clearly to their teams and to their reports so that, um, you know, for example, if a manager is having a grumpy day or doesn't want to engage in a conversation, then they say, well, if I'm grumpy and I'm not wanting to engage, it's not because you're terrible or I hate you or, or I'm, I'm terrible and I am hateful. It's because I just had uh, a bad day and please give me 15 minutes. You know, I will come back to you. This is, this is just my thing. Like, um, so come to expect it and then we'll be fine. Um, so that's a way for managers to actually set these boundaries and expectations ahead of time to avoid the conflict and confusion and drama down the road. Um, this is, a, so I showed you one example from Oren Ellenbogen, a VP in uh, Forter in Israel. Um, you know, he spells out his motivations, his values, and what he expects from his teams and his reports to deliver and, and be aligned with his values and motivations, or at least bring up areas of misalignment for better collaboration in the future. Uh, this is another example of a manager readme. It's just in a chart format, but it's asking the same questions about expectations, motivations, etc. So there's all different ways you can do this. Here's a re manager readme that's actually on GitHub. It's not, uh, you know, again, an answering these questions about like, what makes you grumpy? What makes me grumpy? How do we handle it when we're grumpy? Um, and this is putting everybody on notice, giving them a plan for negotiating these kind of thorny situations. You can bring this into the team level. Uh, so there's a couple of tools out there. The Manual of Me, which is a way to develop your own README for yourself. So it asks you key questions about how you operate. Um, in a situation where you're trying to intersource with another team, this could be very useful as an icebreaker for getting to know their team and their team getting to know yours and understanding how everybody likes to communicate, what their expectations are, um, what drives them, etc. And so at least you have a human point of reference 
for then when you start to collaborate on actual work. To do this successfully requires us to know ourselves, knowing our boundaries, our values, our likes and dislikes. Uh, there's a lot of tools available to help us understand ourselves in the work context. One very popular one is Moving Motivators, which is a game that you can play to understand which of 10 values that they offer you um, are the most important to you and drive most of the decisions that you make at work, how you like to collaborate, how you like to lead and be led, etc. But again, it requires us to be intentional with ourselves. Um, I'm almost done, so, so uh, I know we have a little time. I think my timekeeper, I lost him. Uh, <laughs> no, I didn't see it. <laughs> so um, I'll try to bring this plane to a landing. Um, just very quickly, like, because I think these are very important for successful inner source collaborations. Our relationships to time. I mentioned how oftentimes in an inner source context, teams might not want to do it because they don't know how to absorb these pull requests that they're going to get from outside teams. Um, so perhaps, you know, doing uh, less of other things is an option to then absorb those pull requests more successfully um, to make the time and the space for that kind of collaboration to, to be actionable. Um, and also in those relationships, if you're spending a lot of time, uh, if, like say for instance you're not inner sourcing, but you're spending so much time in meetings trying to orchestrate all of these different complex aspects of software development with multiple teams that are owning only one part or step in that process, maybe with inner source you can have fewer meetings and more collaboration. Um, you know, and this like speaks to how we actually work and our relationship to work, because if we're allowing our work to control us, we can't be intentional because we're, we're not able to control it instead. So, you know, we, we want to achieve this balance and maintain it over time between, you know, time at work and time at home, but also the time that we're spending at work, being able to focus on the right things and building that space to focus. Um, so not being coming overwhelmed by stress, um, not being overwhelmed by the conflicts that we might create by just uh, relying on our assumptions to direct us in our relationships at work, you know, but actually um, minimizing, stripping away that kind of noise and focusing on the objectives, the goals, which is to deliver software for uh, customers and for the company. The more we do that kind of focusing, the b better our relationships and collaborations will be. We can then actually build alliances that bring in more people, more teams to get more and more done together. Intention protects these collaboration relationships. I showed you the, the roadmaps and uh, we talked a bit about managers and, and teams relating to each other in um, you know, one-on-ones, having honest and transparent conversations, um, you know, also, even JIRA tickets can be a great tool for helping us build collaboration because if we provide the context to act on work reported, then we can all, you know, start work with, uh, you know, we have a context for beginning that work and we're communicating more effectively. And this, over time, can build trust and integrity uh, in our collaborations because, you know, we, we start to develop these habits of informing each other helping each other, listening to each other, while protecting our own boundaries, while listening to ourselves, while adhering to our own values that we say we believe in and, and holding ourselves accountable. Relationships require effort, but when we put the effort forth, we often reap a lot of rewards. These cats seem pretty happy. I think they would tell you, to, they'll tell you that that's true. So uh, thank you for listening to me. Uh, I went over time. Thank you for being patient. If you would like to have lots of interesting reading resources, uh, I, this is a list I maintain of um, leadership and management resources. So everything from collaboration to uh, leadership as a manager, you'll find lots of stuff to read there. Thank you. Questions? Really fascinating. <laughs> um, one one thing, this this was very personal talk. Like like this is like this is what you should be doing yourself, kind of thing. Do you have any experience? Um, like I, I imagine that like um, becoming more mindful and maybe even meditation or something can help with with what you just described. Yes, absolutely. 
Um, but do you have any uh, advice for how you help your organization to become more intentional? And how, how you, um, like what is step zero? Mm -hmm. like I really liked that concept yesterday um, for like, mm -hmm. because it's kind of like the ideal a future that that you can see, but how? What's the, the the journey to get there? Like, how can you start? Do you have any advice on that? Oh boy, I do, and <laughs> I think people have been trying to figure this out for a really long time. I mean, change and it change at scale is just super hard. Um, even in change at, at micro scale is super hard, depending on the environment. You know, people's mindsets, their realities. Are they uh, feeling so overwhelmed with work that they? They can't stop to think, or they don't think they can stop to think. And so trying to in persuade somebody to stop what they're doing and listen to you, you know, you have to be very careful. It requires a higher level of um, persuasion uh, than just, you know, telling them that this is what they should do and they should listen to you and and expect them to do that, um, which, I've, which I've seen, and I've also done that, you know, well, but, I'm, but I'm so right, why can't you just figure this out, come on. Um, that doesn't work. Um, so it's really, again, like think that mindfulness has to start with oneself and saying, hey, this, this expectation that people just do as I say and listen to me, I'm such a guru, hey, maybe that's not the best approach. I have to really listen to them and observe how they're behaving and acting so that I can actually meet them where they are and then try to make some qu kind of change with them. And so uh, I, like to, I like to believe in big bang, big scale change, but often uh, that's a collection of smaller incremental changes that happen in way smaller contexts and settings. It can start with a single one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and that if that one-on-one -on -one is successful, then you might actually have the ripple effects you need to drive that bigger change. But um, as one person, it can be incredible. It's not. I don't think it's possible to to drive all of the change at scale. I mean, so it's it's not impossible. People have done it, but you have to be pretty special to do it. So it sounds like that the best pattern um, is uh, be the change you want to see. Uh, like be be the change you want to see. In yes, yeah. that's where the alignment of values comes into play. Because, you, like in a leadership round, you know, leaders need to align around the same values and behaviors that they want to project out into their teams to drive influence. And if if you have half of the leaders going backwards into command and control and do as I say because I'm your boss and then you have another half of the leaders saying but uh, no we want to drive autonomy and trust and uh, I'm your servant leader to help you people will just get I mean you won't have an aligned organization and then if that starts to become like a message that is uh, or a dynamic that is noticed um, at the organization level like people people will notice that you have you have um, incomplete value pl application that then it just affects the integrity of the organization because it's really only this half doing doing that kind of transformational work. The other half has said we don't need that, we don't we won't do it. And if the company allows that arrangement to persist, people get the impression that they're not we're not very serious about really driving this kind of change, um, or we're only serious for them. But why only them? What, what makes the others so special that they can continue like doing all this dysfunctional stuff? Like nobody's saying anything about it, nobody's doing anything or changing it, and then, and then you probably won't. Ha you'll only have transformation in one area, but not the whole organization. And that will that will create a lot of chaos because then you can't work together. <laughs> Thank you. So, so this is uh, very fascinating, and I, I'm curious, after your six sessions, how long did it take you before you felt that you were effective at pushing that pause button and, and being um, you know, uh, reflective? Oh, so just to be clear, the coaching relationship with my college friend is more about um, having a ladder towards achieving a goal, you know, having or a sequence, I should say. And actually, I, ha I have stopped the sessions temporarily because I had to move to a different country and start my life over again. And so I said, you know what, I'm not really sure what my goals are yet now in this new environment. Like, let's, let's do this, like, let's continue this, uh, the, let's do the remaining four sessions 
when I'm settled a bit. And then I think we will actually make the best use of the time because I'll be addressing that reality that I'll be in. And so that's what we've done. And so I'm supposed to actually write her back <laughs> to continue like meeting with her. And I, and I now have a, a goal that's set in the present tense that I would like her support with. So, but she's not coaching me on any sort of mindfulness, like specifically. For that, um, I listen to a lot of podcasts and use apps, and it's also this daily practice of being aware throughout the day, which is hard to do, but that's it, you know. Stopping and reflecting at work before, uh, before I, you know, I might react to something, have an emotional reaction, like, is this experience what my, what those instincts are telling me it is? Like, I don't know. Maybe I should just wait this out and get more information and then decide. So. Okay, we can take one more question. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Denise. <laughs> So I had an experience uh, early in my tech career. I happened to be working for Apple, which was open to these kinds of things at that time. But um, we started a meditation class that was just kind of an affinity group class. It wasn't around any specific working group. It was just if you'd be interested in learning this technology of meditation, you can come you know, for 90 minutes once a week in this place. right? And we had found some people that would teach it in a non-sectarian way, more mm -hmm. as a technology, although they were Buddhists, right? Um, and it was, it was lovely. It was a lovely thing to have that pause in the middle of the week. It was on a Wednesday. Um, and just dedicate a little time to, you know, spending it other than in the hurry, 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 right? But the most interesting thing was immediately after our meditation session, I had a weekly meeting with Netscape at the time and they were always waiting in the lobby when we came filing out of that room and finally they they said to me what are you doing right before this meeting <laughs> because you're so chill and so <laughs> present and it's like we love meeting with you and so i told them and they were like can we have their number yeah. and they set it up at netscape so there's a ripple effect just from taking the time taking the intention and the thing that meditation gives you is that exactly access to that space. Mm -hmm. And it almost feels effortless. Just the intention of sitting, even if you can't make your mind still, which is actually impossible, the fact that you sat and worked at it gives you time later in your day. So um, if you could want to, if you want to just do one thing, yeah. do that. Totally. Like there are lots of companies now, the people working there just will set up a meditation group and meet in a room for once a week or you know, if you're, you can do it daily in the morning at lunch. Um, and it's just a way to help people have a place where they can pause. Um, also little things that we all do, like so eating lunch, which is I'm a huge failure at eating lunch. Like, I've been struggling with this for years, like the importance of leaving your desk and going outside or just getting away. I'm horrible at that. Um, but many people are not, so <laughs> which is good. Congratulations. Uh, using that lunch area, that lunch time to just build some mindfulness into that, like when you leave the office, oh, you know, noticing the sky, noticing the flowers. You know, this sounds corny, but it really is a way to take yourself out of your head and just remember that you're in a big world that doesn't revolve around you and has all of this complexity in it and maybe it's not about you, you know, it's just things. And just being reminded of that over and over again over time can help maintain perspective so that when a team isn't doing what we want it to do or a person is infuriating us, they, you know, oh, they're not doing that for, on purpose. I don't know what's going on in their life. Maybe, maybe it's those things that I'm not aware of that's driving their behavior, and and I'm going to approach this in a different way than getting mad at them or yelling at them or, or gossiping about them. You know, bringing stress on myself. So that that can help too. 
eat more lunch. <laughs> All right, uh, Lori, we want to thank you thank for you. taking the time to inspire us today. So here's a little gift from Bosch. Oh, yeah. And uh, 